Um, okay, well, um, I would like to thank you all for coming, and I would like to thank Frederick and everyone for organizing this workshop. Um, it is my pleasure to be in Aarhus. It's the second time I'm here. Um, and um, I will ask for 20 minutes, if I may, because what I'm doing is a bit difficult. Um, I also will ask you to bear with me because there's going to be a lot of text on the uh, slides, but I will also try to entertain you with some pictures. Um, the material I'm presenting today is um, a draft of my article that I'm working on with a Danish and Dutch linguist, Hus Kornen, and my aim is to introduce Kornen's revisited etymology of the Germanic lexeme Thane, augmented by my historical contextualization, and to put them both, so to speak, to your test. Um, am I obstructing? Um, I should like to disclaim that uh, though Hus and I first conceived this joint enterprise during a personal meeting, meeting nearly a year ago, the draft that you all hopefully have received is entirely my fabrication, and therefore I have done my best to keep in mind everything I talked about with Hus, uh, but since I'm not a professionally trained linguist, I assume full responsibility for any potential flaws in the field of linguistics should they follow any. Unfortunately, due to a busy schedule, Hus hadn't been able to review my text before I submitted it. Um, Scandinavian and Anglo-Saxon Thanes are the direct object of my study in my PhD thesis, on which I'm working at the University of Gothenburg, and each time, um, each of my presentations begs two explanations. One, who were the Thanes, and two, why studying them? Um, I'll probably shoot myself in the leg by distributing some popular literature for you to sort of uh, connects to what I'm doing. This is a popular journal that uh, you will probably find online if you type Anglo-Saxon Thane, and I disagree with 90% of what is written here, but I still own it, please. And um, okay, I, I, disagree. I do not disagree with the archaeological part, but with the conceptual part, yes, quite a lot. And also, um, this is a nice brochure I received uh, in um, Varnham uh, in Vestergotland, and I've uh, put a label where you can read a popular paragraph on the things in Vesterjotland. Um, if you're interested, I can explain how it got there. There you go. It's in Swedish, but I hope everyone is fine with that. Um, back to my presentation. Replying to those two questions, who were the things and why studying them, I've come up with this following shorthand answer. On the both coasts of the North Sea in the late Viking Age, things were probably what today is termed elite and their arguably leading social role, or at the very least, high social standing justifies the study. Now, elite literally means chosen, that is, chosen people in the sociological terms, and for the sake of brevity, I shall resort to the definition of an elite adopted by the French historians uh, <coughs> Régine Lejean and Laurent Feller. Uh, you can see it on the screen. I'm not saying it's the only uh, explanation. There's actually quite a debate in sociology of what we term an elite but um, it's just for the sake of brevity. Um, the notion of the Thane's elite position is arrived at on the grounds that both in England and Scandinavia, literate people consider their role important enough to give it space of whatever limited media were at hand, be it parchment, stone, or an oral scold extensa. Again, if, if you're interested, I can talk later on about those numbers that I'm bring, bringing uh, in the slide. In theory, all this looks good so far, but in practice there is a minimum of two empirical challenges. One is that the Anglo-Saxon Thanes, of whom we have the most extensive knowledge, that is the King's Thanes, seem to have almost nothing in common with their contemporary counterparts in Scandinavia. Unlike them, the Norse Thanes, known primarily from the 46 Danish and Swedish runic inscriptions and 28 Viking Age Norwegian scold extances, uh, reveal very few personal bonds with the regional rulers if one assesses the aforementioned sources impartially. This is a picture I took in um, Vesterjotland, um, and here's a little, little uh, explanation of what, how do I? Of what it says. Uh, Ulfur and Ozo raised the stone in memory of Aslakar, a very good thing, their father very brave and valiant. Anyone sees any connection to the royal power? I don't. Um, yeah, we can discuss this again later. Um, but, um, yeah, where was I? 
for for instance, uh, the Norwegian law of Frostathing mentions a testimony of twelve things. I quote: "Free man and a full age." End quote. Cleansing one of an accusation of housebreaking. Nothing speaks of their authority as being derived from uh, a chieftain. On the other hand, within the uh, old, within the late old English evidence, we have not only the well of kings, thanes, lords in their own right, but traces of a much wider social group also called thanes in uh, by the sources, but otherwise incompatible with the monarch's men. We have in our possession. Uh, some knowledge that commended men of the lords other than the king uh, might have been described as thanes, although a baba was referring to the numerous small land tenants called tiny in the Doomsday Book. I'll briefly remind that the Doomsday Book is a nationwide land survey undertaken in the closing years of William the Conqueror, two decades after he had taken over England. Uh, back to the tiny, the Doomsday Book records hundreds of them in 1066 the average land holding being times smaller than an average land grant of a West Saxon king to his thane. There is no doubt that we're dealing with one and the same word, but at the same time, we also witness it being applied to considerably different social groups. Uh, naturally, all lexemes tend to evolve their meanings through time, but two essential questions I'm addressing in my current paper are, one, what could have the original meaning of the word thane been? And two, if all its subsequent meanings are derived from one ancestor, what do they tell us about the possible implications of this evolution? Answering those questions uh, shall be carried out in line with the German philologist Hans Kuhn's cautious notion warning that linguistic observations themselves do not confer knowledge about actual historical institutions. At best, they tell us the categories people used to describe a certain social phenomena, but they do not tell us about the phenomena themselves. Um, historically, the commonly accepted etymology of the Germanic word thane and its cognates connects it with the reconstructed Proto-Indo-European root tech, uh, meaning to give birth to. It is usually said to find evidence in a similar suffix and o formation in the ancient Greek technon, meaning a child of either gender, um, to sort of contextualize uh, according to Suetonius, um, Caesar, upon his murder, said, uh, Kaisu Tecno, so that the famous quote, which is usually misspelled, etu brute, um, sort of to contextualize the, the, the piece. As far as historiography is concerned, most scholars prudently abstain from reflecting upon the subsequent shifts in the Thane semantics um, or, or meanings. It seems that it's the Danish historian and archivist Sven Okje who may claim the credit for unfolding the full probable chain of semantic transitions. In summary, Okje's reconstruction has been visualized on the screen. You can also see his portrait there. Uh, from a theoretical and historical perspectives, iterations from two to six are not improbable. The evolutionary model from young man to a servant or warrior is well attested. Uh, in the European languages, demonstrate an abundance of usages of such gender age terms for social categories. On the screen, you can see uh, some of the relevant examples. All of them essentially mean boy or young man or lad, uh, you name it. Uh, and all of them can denote servants and specifically armed retainers. For the sake of the record, it should be mentioned that uh, none of them is thought to originate from the meaning to give birth to. What Okia seemingly failed to clarify is the later Old Norse usage for the word thane in the literary prose sources that do not really convey the sense of warrior, servant, or vassal. If anything, it is rather synonymous with the general term for man, mother, in Old Norse, uh, with many of its nuances and subtle sub-meanings, the most common of the latter being uh, subject of a monarch. Uh, perhaps the neatest summary uh, of the words connotations in Old Norse was proposed by Ebbe Hetzberg, free and independent practitioner of all rights of a person fully vested with liberties. Uh, however, with a possible amendment to Orca's reconstruction, a feasible explanation might be reached by taking a step back along the chain of transitions. Um, it could be argued that Thane's core meaning had to do not with a service, but with the notion of a male human being, that is, that the primary semantics had always been young man. Hence, the technical sense of a young man in the service of a lord 
could have been secondary and applied only in a socially narrower context of a retinue. With this in mind, we could hypothesize that the chronologically later Old Norse usage uh, of the word thane actually reflects an earlier semantics. From the historical perspective, the weak point of such an assumption is that it finds no support in the older Anglo-Saxon sources. As far as I'm aware, nowhere is the Old English lexeme thane synonymous with man or the like. In contrast, in my draft, I brought out the examples to the contrary when the Anglo-Saxon authors opposed the thanes to the rest of the populace. Despite all said above, Hus Cornyn has recently shown that given our, our modern knowledge of historical linguistics, derivation of the Germanic thane from the Proto-Indo-European techno uh, is not linguistically warranted. In his etymological dictionary of Proto-Germanic, he traces two possible outcomes of techno in Germanic languages, none of which is actually present. The first one, had the first syllable been stressed under Grimm's law, this would have produced the otherwise non-attested thechna. However, the well-known addition to this rule, Werner's law, explains that Proto-Germanic H becomes the voice H if preceded by a non-accentuated uh, syllable. Therefore, we might expect an according stress in techno, that is, techno. But had the second syllable been stressed under Kluge's law, Techno uh, should have resulted in the Proto-Germanic theka, which is not attested either. Granted, at present, Kluge's law still meets criticism in linguistics, but the very Greek resultant word technon serves a way to argument to believe that the Proto-Indo-European uh, techno uh, must have had the stress on the first syllable. Instead, uh, Kornan offers a much simpler solution, deriving Thane from Proto-Germanic Thegyan to request. He elegantly suggests that, I quote, both in Germanic and the other Indo-European branches, the original meaning seems to have been to reach out the hand, whence both to request and to accept. The bottom, the bottom line of this argument would be that Thane never meant child or young man, and from the very beginning denoted a retainer, that is to say, one who requests and accepts patronage in, uh, and protection in exchange for service. Kuhnen's etymology solves the problem of the English usage and uh, fits in really well with the earlier sources. These are all from the late 7th century, and there are three of them, the Epinal Erfurt Glossary and the Low Codes of King Inner of Wessex and King Wittred of Kent. The former uses thing to gloss the Latin asecula, that is follower or servant, and the two latter use the word thane as, a, as part of what Hans Kuhn called Rangbezeichnung, a combination of a noun denoting a man or a warrior with a possessive pronoun or genitivus possessivus of another noun. Thanes as an independent lexeme also get 26 mentions in Beowulf with the most basic meaning uh, a warrior companion and a similar practice is to be found in Old High German and Old Saxon. As for Old Norse, the situation looks precarious. The runic inscriptions and later prose sources do not really conform with this pattern. The poetic Edda features 12 instances of Thane being used as an appellative, but the constant vexing problem with such mythological texts is their dating. And at any rate, some occurrences in the Edda rather agree with the contemporary prose usage. On the other hand, the skaldic verse does, does indeed employ Thane in the context that allows rendering it warrior or something similar. But the evidence alone is inconclusive because the poetic cons uh, constraints often make it vague and resist a single definitive interpretation. Luckily, as early as 1947, the Swedish historian Erik Elkvist has identified 12 habitations in Sweden and two in southeastern Norway bearing the name Thänebur. Uh, uh, toponyms resembling the same name in model were, in all likelihood, settlements of warriors, presumably created by the local leaders. Uh, so it is reasonable to think that Thänebur fell in the same line. As for the dating, linguistically it could well predate the middle of the 10th century. The absence of place names like Drengebu points to the earlier dating of Thänebu when the Old Norse word Drenger had not yet embraced the meaning of a retainer or warrior, but such settlements had already existed. 
By solving the problem of the earlier sources, we are nevertheless still left with the same obstacle as indicated for Occhia's etymology described above. If the word thane should be interpreted retainer or warrior or servant and not broadly man, what are we to make of the older Old Norse, uh, I'm sorry, younger Old Norse uh, usage in the prose sources? Uh, well, I believe there exists a solution. So far, I have been able to spot two parallels in the Indo-European languages when words meaning a servant or retainer shifted their meanings or usage to describe subject or people. One is a polysemantic uh, Latin lexeme Leodus found in the Frankish sources. As far as I'm aware, it can mean three things. One definitely refers to Leodus as the king's, warriors, compa uh, king's warrior companions, although, as mentioned by Franz uh, Isegler, they, I quote, were not simple followers but lords of followings in the service of the king, end quote. The second makes Leodus synonymous with the concept of a war guild uh, that is a legal term to mean a man price, and this immediately reminds one of the Old Norse compound thing guilty to mean the same thing. Finally, Leodus can have a third broad application to denote people in general, though there is a tendency to see it more as subjects. Apparently, the uh, transition occurred al along the line from personal retainer to imp impersonal subject, and not the other way around. In my draft, I've extensively quoted the Cambridge historian David Green, who laid out the uh, plausible reconstruction of how this might have happened, and you can see it on the screen. The second parallel is far more tentative, but is still somewhat thought-provoking. Starting at the reign of the Russian Grand Prince Ivan III in the second half of the 15th century, the Russian nobility assumed the formal title of monarch's serfs or servants when petitioning the Grand Princes. The most convincing theorists suggest that this reflected the addressing formula of the Grand Prince to the Mongolian Great Khan. After Ivan III had won independence from the Horde, he assumed a sovereign status and with it the according terminology. The petition formula, I thy serf, did not imply social humiliation of the petitioner, but established him or her as the Grand Prince's vassal. In 1702, Peter I insisted upon a new formula, Your Majesty's humble servant, oh, I'm sorry, Your Majesty's humble slave. Uh, and that formula united all estates regardless of their actual status and relation to the crown. Unlike the preceding word for serf, which had a strong linguistic connotation of humiliating serfdom, the chosen word for slave, the Russian rab, um, belonged to the higher register of the language and did not suggest indignity. Nevertheless, feeling a semiotic inadequacy in the new social circumstance, circumstances in 1786, Catherine II institutionalized a new address in the official correspondence, loyal subject. Granted, this evolutionary transformation does not fully mirror the one in the Franker sources. Yet here too we are able to tackle the conceptual transition from a servant to subject, be it even in very different social, political and ideological circumstances. These two examples have been brought up as a demonstration that both the linguistic and conceptual evolution from servant to subject is not impossible and does not preclude Cronin's etymology. If one concedes that the general sense of a free man for the word thane in the Old Norse usage was secondary to and expanded from a supposedly earlier meaning subject. This meaning subject can be detected as early as the late ten tens. In one of his writs, King Canute addressed his Anglo-Saxon subject as all my things, 1200s and 200s. The numbers in this formula refer to the traditional West Saxon war guilds for the commoners and nobility respectively, and verbal mnemonic formulae commoners versus noblemen are actually prominent in both Old English and Old Norse. Yet apart from one somewhat questionable text, the Old English sources do not apparently uh, apply the plural thanus as an umbrella term to cover all free population. Compare it to, for example, a contemporary marriage agreement witnessed by, I quote, everyone of standing in Kent and Sussex, both thane and churl, end quote, where churl, a commoner, is opposed to a thane, a nobleman. If anything, 
Knut's unusual wording closely resembles the contemporary usage in Old Norse, where around the same time the skald uh, Ottasvati, who also served Knut, called the Shetlanders, recently subjugated by his former patron, uh, Olaf Halson of Norway, uh, he called them Olaf's Thener. Or think of the 13th century saga collection known as Fagerskina, in which it is said that Magnus, son of the same Olaf the Saint, um, was acknowledged king of Norway, I quote, with, with consent of all subjects, both rich and not, as well as all the crowd, where, the fra where this phrase, uh, by the rik, uh, rikra ok urikra, resembles that of the Canute uh, two centuries earlier. One has to assume that the two less well-documented centuries from roughly 1050 to 1220 were enough time for the thing's connotation to partially overlap with a more neutral and general sense of a free man. In fact, this could have well have started already in the Viking Age or earlier, because the runic evidence does not yield any sense of a military retinue per se. Given the instance of an actual verbal change of Thane for mother in some medieval manuscripts brought forward in my draft and in one of my earlier slides, as of now, I do not see major objection, objections to this hypothesis. As to how this change might have happened, one could depart from the analogy with the Frankish sources uh, as the closest parallel, though my historical training precludes me from wholeheartedly approving such an initiative and motivates to stay within my disciplinary borders. In conclusion, from my point of view, the extant records speak more in favor of Cronin's etymo revisited etymology rather than against it. The assumption that Thane is indeed derived from the Proto-Germanic Thegian, not connected to the ancient Greek Technon, and must have at its core meant retainer or servant, rather than child or young man, fits in really well with the chronology of the sources, and answers the question of why the general sense of a man is present only in the later Old Norse text, but not in the earlier Old English or continental ones. Has this conclusion got, should it be correct, any historical implications? Uh, yes and no. As disclaimed in the beginning, uh, linguistic observations alone do not function as a tool in an actual historical research. A likely ejection of the word Thane from the patrimonial sphere does not inform us about the nature of the relationship between the Viking Age Thane and his lord just yet. It merely casts some dim light on the language employed to describe such relationships. To simplify, what does this new etymology tell us about the Thanes in the 46 Scandinavian runic inscriptions from the Viking Age? Only that at some point, some point, this word must have meant a king's retainer, but whether those 46 individuals actually were ones, this remains to be studied by historians further. And with this being said, I thank you very much for your attention, and I'm, I'm, I will be very eager to answer your questions should you have any. Thank you very much.